Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So today we will be talking about a paper recently published in JAMA Surgery about prophylactic embolization of patients with blunt trauma at high risk uh, of splenectomy. Uh, this will be followed by a teaching session by Professor Sobobel Subramanian on understanding diagnostic tests. This will be the first part of uh, a two um, sets of episodes, so stay tuned for more. So hi everyone, so um, the paper that we've um, chosen for tonight's cram surge is this one, so it's looking at the effects of prophylactic embolization um, for patients with blunt splenic trauma who were deemed to be high risk of splenectomy. Um, and it was a JAMA surge paper that was published in September of this year. Um, so Joe, would you be able to just go into a little bit about why we thought this paper would be useful for us um, on general surgery? Well, yeah, um, well, first of all, blunt splenic trauma is a very common issue. Um, if you work in a trauma center, pretty much with every cycle of on call, you'll see uh, a few of them. Um, we do know that embolization that has been around since the early 2000s as a sort of commonly available option uh, to treat this patient does improve the rate of spleen preservation in patients that do definitely require one. Uh, what we do not know for sure, based on the data that we've got, is whether a prophylactic embolization uh, in a subset of patients that are high risk uh, for a splenectomy actually help uh, improve uh, splenic preservation um, after initial presentation. And the purpose of this paper is exactly to uh, identify that. Now, um, we have a quick reminder about um, um, the uh, grading of splenic injuries. Uh, this will be quite relevant uh, later on uh, during the proper presentation. Uh, as we pretty much all know, um, there's five grades of um, splenic injury. Uh, in this particular paper, uh, we will be focusing on grade three to grade five, excluding uh, shutter spleen, but we will uh, go into a bit more details later on. Uh, in the meantime, uh, just remember about this uh, little diagram. Uh, so, ball back to you, Becky. Thank you. Um, okay, so the main aims of the paper was to um, determine at whether a one month um, time point, the spleen salvage rate in these patients was better after prophylactic splenic artery embolization or after surveillance. So to kind of translate that over into a PICO question, our population being patients with blunt splenic trauma um, within 48 hours, and I'll go into um, the inclusion criteria in a little bit more detail um, in a couple of slides time. Um, our intervention being prophylactic embolization compared to surveillance and our outcome being the spleen preservation and salvage rate. So the methods, the paper use, so it was a randomized clinical multi-center trial which was based in France. And um, so it was looking at patients who were admitted through ED, ITU and these shock treatment units between February of 2014 and September of 2017. In an attempt to try and um, avoid bias, they did use blinding of the assessors. Um, randomization was performed with um, stratification according to the centres. And they also used a power calculation to try and determine the study participant size. And Gio, I was hoping that you might be able to go into a little bit more detail, particularly about those last three points. Yeah, so um, they do a very good job at uh, performing blinding of the radiologists. Uh, that are assessing the scans uh, that uh, are performed throughout this trial. Um, they do work both at blinding at the local center where the patient is admitted and centrally, where two very experienced radiologists actually review all the scans of the included patients. They do also provide quite a lot of training um, to make sure that the um, radiologists are all on the same playing field when they are reviewing their scans. Um, and they do uh, try and reach a consensus uh, when there is discrepancy between the grading of the splenic injury between different radiologists. 
So overall, they did a, a good job at training the assessors there. Um, concerning the power calculation, just want to make a quick point here. We will go back to it later on. Uh, they do use to make the power calculation uh, a, an expected uh, splenic preservation rate in presence of blunt trauma in high risk patients when observation is carried out as an, uh, as, um, uh, an intervention um, of 60%. So they do expect about 40% of the patients admitted and only observed to uh, have the spleen taken out at some point. And this is a fairly high number. Um, which does not really correspond to the reality that we see, and we'll talk about it a bit more later. Uh, Bo, back to you, Becky. Thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned, the, these were the um, these are the inclusion criteria for the paper. So um, the patients had to be over 18 um, with blunt splenic injury. They did have to be hemodynamically stable. And as Gio had mentioned, this paper particularly looked at patients with grade 3 or above. Um, so if they were classified as having grade three splenic injury, they also required hemoperitoneum on the CT scan, on initial CT imaging, um, or a new injury severity score of over 15. And um, we'll post a paper at the end of this just with a little bit more information about what that actually means. As Gio mentioned, they excluded patients who were deemed to have a shattered spleen and patients who required emergency embolization. So, um, that's patients with, you know, active bleeding with splenic artery aneurysm on the CT scan or with splenic arterial venous fistulas. This is a little timeline um, and the, the outcomes that the, that the team were looking at. So with, with T0 being obviously um, the initial day of imaging where the patients were randomised into the two arms of the trial. They then looked at these three main time points, so five days, one month, and six months. The primary outcome being that at that one month time period, um, the patients were deemed to have at least 50% vascularised parenchyma of the spleen, and they hadn't had a splenectomy. Um, there were also a few secondary outcomes that they looked at. Um, Gia, would you be able to go into those in a bit more detail? Yeah, they look at quite a few things. Um, particularly uh, at uh, one month uh, and at five days. Uh, they look at uh, death rate, they look at splenectomy rate, they look at the development of uh, vascular splenic abnormalities, and here we are talking mostly about pseudoaneurysms. Um, they do look at the rate of urgent embolization uh, in both groups, as well as thromboembolic complications. Um, at six months, uh, they look at the overall length of admissions for these patients, the uh, spleen rescue rate at six months, the total time of work, and they also do use a questionnaire to evaluate their uh, physical activity. Uh, patients get scanned uh, at every time point highlighted in this timeline, so uh, five days, one month, and six months. Uh, Bo, back to you, Becky. Thank you. Okay, um, so this is quite a nice flow diagram that they actually include in the paper. So as you can see, in the initial, in kind of initial um, assignment to each arm, there were 71 patients um, in the prophylactic embolization arm and 69 in the surveillance arm. We can see that by the the primary um, primary outcome point at one month, this had dropped down to 57 and 60, and um, this diagram shows quite nicely the reasons why patients dropped out. So it included things such as patients not having um, health insurance coverage, um, images being regraded, so the splenic injury being regraded, um, and also withdrawal of consent. So these were the results that they that they came out with. So um, the primary outcome has shown that there was no statistically significant difference between the two arms of the trial. So it found that within the embolization group, there were 56 of 57 patients who were deemed to have adequate splenic vascularization at the one month time point. And in the surveillance arm, there was 56 of 60. Um, so that was a p-value of 0.37. So there was no statistical um, significant difference there. Um, there were a few secondary time points that we that we picked out. Gia, would you be able to go through those for everybody? Yeah, uh, we've highlighted here uh, the sort of what we deem to be the most relevant secondary outcomes, really, because there's uh, quite a big list. 
Um, fairly important to mention at day five, uh, the um, prophylactic embolization group uh, had one case of pseudoaneurysm out of 65 versus eight out of 65 in the surveillance group. I mean, this is kind of expected when there has been no uh, arterial uh, intervention performed uh, in the surveillance group, um, but it is uh, statistically um, significantly different uh, as well. Uh, in terms of secondary embolization, this is quite a relevant point. So uh, about 20 out of 65, so 19 out of 65 to be more exact, patients in the surveillance group end up getting an embolization at some point um, throughout the trial period. And uh, one out of 65 in the prophylactic embolization group and ends up having a further embolization on top of the original one. Um, and obviously this is statistically significant difference and it is expected as well. Uh, length of stay is slightly shorter in the prophylactic group and this does reach statistical significance as well. Uh, nine days versus 13 days. Um, overall, uh, in terms of complications or the chosen intervention, uh, there is no uh, significant difference at uh, day five and at one month between the two groups. So they do seem to be pretty equivalent in terms of overall outcomes. Uh, ball back to you, Becky. Thank you. Okay, so just to, to kind of talk through some of the limitations of the paper, there were some that were self-reported. So. Um, the power calculation and the sample size, which Chia will go into a bit more detail about for us. Um, second, um, secondly, there were potentially some unknown confounders. So the paper does mention that the two groups of the two arms of the group are relatively well matched with regards to kind of age and sex, but there were potentially other unknown confounders such as weight or smoking, which they didn't particularly look at. Um, they also mentioned um, irradiation levels and kind of the medical and economic costs between the two arms. Um, as Gio had said, they, each patient was imaged at those four time points, which wouldn't necessarily be something that, that would be translatable into everyday practice. Um, and that kind of then leads on to the external validity, um, particularly what they mentioned about outside the context of a clinical trial, um, the amount of surveillance surveillance and rigorous monitoring that patients had would, would probably not translate to to um, everyday practice. Um, and I'll hand over to Gio just to go through some of the other limitations that we thought of when we were kind of reviewing the paper. Yeah, so we picked up a few further points. Um, as Becky mentioned, the authors do highlight how the power calculation does have some problems. Uh, if you remember um, when I introduced this issue earlier on, uh, I mentioned that they used a 60% splenic preservation rate expected uh, at one month uh, in the surveillance group. Now, if you noticed in this trial, they achieved a, a more than 90% um, splenic preservation rate in both groups. Um, it is worth mentioning, however, that the data that they use is related to surveillance without the availability of embolization. And back in the early 2000s, way before this trial was actually designed, uh, there, were, there was a decent amount of evidence to suggest that in the presence of embolization, uh, as an available option, not done prophylactically. In this particular subset of patients, splenic preservation rate would actually be quite higher, between 80 and 90 percent. And I believe that should have been the number they used to make the power calculation, which would, would have resulted in a sort of uh, smaller difference between, uh, expected difference between the two groups and therefore a significantly higher number of patients required to be enrolled in the study in order to obtain um, adequate power. Um, if you look at the flowchart that we uh, highlighted earlier on, uh, a few patients were restaged uh, when their scans were looked at by two external, very experienced radiologists. Um, that does change the, uh, the stage of the grade of splenic injury that they sustained based on radiological findings and therefore excludes them from the trial. In real life, however, um, those patients would have been treated based on the original report from the radiologist in the original institution where the patient was admitted. So some patients were potentially artificially excluded from the study. Um, there possibly is some halo effect. Uh, we do know that it's quite difficult to uh, get an interventional radiologist in hour um, or out of hours uh, to uh, perform certain interventions. Um, I think uh, if they know they are involved in this trial, uh, it probably is easier to get them to do stuff. Um, and I believe that this effect would 
possibly be more visible if the patient comes in on a Friday evening um, and has a whole weekend uh, to wait for a potential embolization that's not actually emergent or urgent. And the authors don't really mention anything about uh, um, admissions, uh, overnight admissions during weekend days and what effect it has on uh, uh, the uh, embolization rate. Uh, I'm not entirely sure this will be fully applicable to a UK centre, uh, given the availability of uh, um, interventional radiologists that we uh, do have. However, uh, this depends on site to site availability. Um, my rant is finished, so ball back to you, Becky. Okay. So to summarise, the paper found that there, there was no significant difference between the two arms, so between prophylactic embolisation and surveillance when managing patients with splenic trauma who were at high risk of splenectomy. Um, and this is a table that we've created just to show some of the pros and cons that, um, that we felt the paper had. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Right. OK, so um, we're going to do a I guess a couple of tutorials on diagnostic test studies, how to critically appraise diagnostic test studies, and also how to use the results of diagnostic tests in your practice. Um, so we'll see how part one goes. So we'll start off with why diagnostic tests are important. Um, I don't need to um, explain this in too much detail to you guys. So essentially, you know, a diagnostic test will help you make decisions um, in the management of your patients and to move patients forward along a pathway. So if you have somebody with right eye left foot pain, and we'll use that example during the course of this talk, uh, and you're querying appendicitis, you do a white cell count, if it's 25 or so, then you think, right, this could be something significant. And then you might do the next appropriate thing, whatever is appropriate in your setting. You might ask for an ultrasound or a CT, or you might ask for a senior review, um, and, and, and then uh, do the next thing. Um, understanding the parameters of diagnostic accuracy um, and relating them to clinical practice, in my experience, observing um, junior doctors, um, I think is patchy at best. It doesn't reflect uh, on the junior doctors, it reflects on the training they've had in understanding diagnostic test parameters. And we'll talk about the parameters in a minute. Um, even worse is evaluating these tests in a research setting, especially because these kinds of studies are subject to a number of pitfalls and sources of bias. And therefore, I think um, this, it is useful to uh, get to grips with the basic principles of diagnostic tests and um, uh, how to interpret the various parameters that you've probably come across. Okay, now what do we need to understand about diagnostic tests? There are a number of what I call parameters, and by these I simply refer to these terms that you've probably heard of before many times, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, test accuracy, and then likelihood ratio of a positive test and likelihood ratio of a negative test. So you've probably heard uh, of most of the terms here, and uh, we're going to discuss them in a little bit more detail in this talk. Now, the role of these tests and their specific utility depends on a number of um, different issues. The first is, are you looking at these tests in a diagnostic sort of scenario, or is it um, a screening setting? So are you using it to screen for maybe colorectal cancer or breast cancer? in the general population, or are you specifically looking for a specific diagnosis when patients are presented with symptoms? Like, for example, a diagnosis of acute appendicitis in somebody that presents with right eye for of pain. It also depends on whether this is um, being evaluated in research or in clinical practice. And if it's research, what kind of research? Observational research, RCT research, uh, under observational studies, is it case control or a cohort study and so on? And again, I hope as I explain this further, that will become clear. The role of these parameters and the utility also depends on the nature of the question. Are you trying to rule in a particular problem? Are you using a test to rule out a diagnosis? Um, have you got just one differential? For example, are you asking the question, is this acute, acute appendicitis or renal colic? Or are you asking the question, what is the cause of um, this person's abdominal pain? 
for which there might be a couple of dozen differential diagnoses. And finally, um, how you use these parameters depends on disease prevalence and whether you know what the prevalence of disease is. In other words, um, if you think again of acute right arrow cause of pain, uh, are you looking at a patient in a GP practice of, or out of our center uh, where you get lots of abdominal pains and only a small proportion of patients turn out to have acute appendicitis? Or are you looking at a patient in the surgical admission unit where the patient has already been evaluated by an SHO um, or a court trainee and admitted in the admission unit and you're being called on as registrar to come and exclude appendicitis? So these um, um, issues, these contexts are very important in deciding which of these various parameters uh, are important in that particular um, setting. Okay, let's start off with a scenario. It's always good to start off with an example, put matters in context, and then try and pick out the values of these parameters. So I've got an abstract from a paper in The Lancet from almost 20 years ago. But this is a very interesting paper um, with uh, some important lessons for us all. So this was a case control study on the new screening technique in ovarian cancer. And just to give a bit of background, you probably all know this, ovarian cancer is quite aggressive. Most patients present late and management options are pretty limited in the, uh, because patients present with advanced disease. Right. So if you have a, a screening technique that identifies women at risk of ovarian cancer, that will be quite a promising um, thing to uh, work on or, and lots of people will be interested in it. So the study looked at a special technique um, where they draw, uh, drew a blood sample and looked at the patterns of a number of um, peptides in the blood. Uh, essentially, the technique is called serum proteomic profiling using cell detox mass spec. You don't have to worry about the technique, just to know that it was cutting edge technique at least uh, 15, 20 years ago. And this study had all the landmark uh, hallmarks of a landmark paper. New findings, they used advanced proteomics and bioinformatic techniques. It was a famous institution in the US and the publication is in a um, reputed journal. So, so, so um, it's going to create a lot of interest in a lot of people, especially people involved in ovarian cancer management. So let's look at the data. So I've summarized the data from this fairly complex paper into a simple two by two contingency table. So two by two table, meaning that you've got cancer and healthy people and um, uh, the, the data for these patients arranged in columns and in rows you've got the special test we'll just call it the proteomic test uh, and the test results arranged as positive and negative so you've got four cells a b c and d and you have uh, and the um, test results in patients with and without cancer arranged uh, in this specific order so uh, Hopefully that will be obvious um, on the screen. So you've got 50 patients with ovarian cancer who had a positive test. No patients with ovarian cancer had an, a negative test. Three patients without ovarian cancer with some other benign ovarian disease had a positive test. And 63 benign patients had a negative test. Okay, so on the face of it, it looks like a great test. So let's look at the, the parameters that we um, tend to talk about. So sensitivity. Sensitivity is essentially the number of patients with the disease that the test picked up, or the test was positive. So it's A over A plus C. The next one is specificity. So this refers to the proportion of patients without the disease who were test negative. Okay, so that's 95%. So you had a sensitivity of 100%, specificity of 95%, right? The third um, parameter that we often talk about for diagnostic tests is accuracy. Accuracy basically refers to the proportion of um, all test results that turned out to be true. So it is A and A plus D, I'm sorry for the typo, it has to be A plus D 
divided by the whole um, cohort of patients, A, B, C, D. So that was 97.4%. So somewhere between the sensitivity and specificity values. The next thing they reported on in this paper is what we call the positive predictive value, which is the number of patients with a positive test, which is A plus B, who actually have the disease. So that's 94%. And negative predictive value is the proportion of patients who did not have the disease amongst the negative uh, test cohort. So that is D over C plus D. That is 100%. So I'm sorry if this is all getting a bit too much, but um, you can always come back and uh, look at these definitions and see if the calculations um, are right. The calculations are right as presented. So uh, we'll just uh, you know, move on. So you might think, what's the problem? So you've got really good values, so sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, positive and negative predictive value. So um, this test must be um, really super and should really be implemented um, and used as a screening test for ovarian cancer if it is replicated and validated by other studies, right? No, there's a hitch though. So let's look at the table again. Now, a positive predictive value of 94% it's just too good to be true. Why do I say that? If you look at breast cancer screening and the role of screening mammograms, the positive predictive value of mammograms, if there are any breast surgeons out there, is actually just 12 to 46% across a range of studies. And at that positive predictive value, we say mammogram is a great screening test. Okay. Now, colorectal surgeons will tell you that the positive predictive value for fecal local blood in screening for colorectal cancer is between 6 and 27 percent. And they consider that as a really good screening test um, at that uh, low positive predictive value values. So if you have a test, a screening test for ovarian cancer, and you say that the positive predictive value is 94 percent, you should be getting the Nobel Prize, right? But that's not what these authors have got. That's because predictive values should not be used in this scenario because predictive values depend very much on disease prevalence. So what do I mean? This study that you have here is a case control study. Why case control? Because the authors have, um, have uh, recruited a group of ovarian cancer patients. They've recruited another group of patients who had some kind of benign ovarian disease. This is an artificial setting where the cases and controls are pre-selected. And in this kind of scenario, the prevalence is almost 50% or 43% to be exact. 50 ovarian cancers and 66 healthy people. In real life, however, ovarian cancer prevalence is 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 2,500 in postmenopausal women. So I, I hope you'll agree with me that this is a very artificial set, um, scenario, and that's what case control studies are. They rely on the investigators choosing cases and choosing an appropriate um, uh, number of controls, and then looking back to see if the tests are positive or negative, or if the risk factors present or absent. Okay. So in such um, uh, studies, you should not calculate predictive values, because predictive values depend on um, disease prevalence. Now, there's an epidemiologist who wrote back in a letter to the editor on this paper, and, he's, and he presented this table. So what he did was he presented a table that compared specificity and disease prevalence and worked out the positive predictive values. So what he said was at a specificity of 95%, which is what this study showed, with a disease prevalence of 43%, as in the study, the positive predictive value is 94%. That's good. But in real life, as the prevalence drop, the positive predictive value will also drop. And if you look at the positive predictive value at a prevalence of 1 per 2,500, which is the prevalence of, of ovarian cancer in the postmenopausal women, the positive predictive value is 0.8%. So it's not 94% as reported in the Lancet, it is 0.8%. And that is where um, the, the um, authors got this wrong. So great journal, 
reputable institution, famous authors, scientists, um, very well uh, renowned scientists in their own right, lots of complex technology, but a basic error in the understanding of what pre predictive values mean. And this um, led to an error in the reporting of positive predictive value uh, in the Lancet. Okay, so then the question is, right, what parameters do we use? I've said, I've mentioned sensitivity, specificity, predictive values, likelihood ratios. And then you're thinking, right, what, what do I use now? Now, this depends really on your study design. Is it a case control or cohort study if it's an observational design? And it also depends on your question. So you've got to review your study design, your question carefully. Now, just to summarize, I would say that sensitivity and specificity are not particularly useful in your clinical practice. So let's say you have somebody with right eye of pain and you do an ultrasound scan and you get a positive result, thick in the appendix with a bit of fluid and so on and so forth. And you look up the British Journal of Surgery and you find that the sensitivity of ultrasound in appendicitis is 85% and the specificity is 90%. So where does that leave you with that particular patient? What's the probability of appendicitis in that patient who has got a positive ultrasound result? the sensitivity and specificity is not going to help you. And, and th th there are other parameters that would be of more use. However, these two parameters are of use in comparing different tests in a research setting. So if you're comparing ultrasound, CT, MR, and appendicitis, and you get sensitivities and specificities from a research study, then that will be of use. Or they'll be useful in a systematic review. But they are not of use in a clinical setting, and they also can exaggerate benefits of a specific test. Okay, so keep that in mind while we move on to predictive values. For predictive values, you need prevalence, prevalence numbers, and the data on prevalence can be difficult to obtain because they differ from setting to setting. The prevalence of acute appendicitis in a GP setting is going to be very different to a prevalence of acute appendicitis in the surgical admission unit. Okay, and prevalence can should only be calculated from cohort studies not from case control studies as these authors mistakenly did. And prevalence is uh, of particular use in screening studies because in screening studies you're conducting the study in a healthy population or in the, in the general population, people at risk. So you know what the prevalence is going to be in people at risk or you should know. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll explain this again. So sensitivity and specificity are not particularly useful in cl clinical practice. They are more of use in research or if you're doing a systematic review comparing tests. Prevalent as predictive values are of use in screening studies. Okay, so you're wondering what about diagnostic studies then? What do I use in uh, when I'm, a, I'm on call and uh, evaluating a patient with the right electrosa pain? Likelihood ratios. This is what um, ought to be used. And you think this is not something we commonly talk about. I've probably not heard of them. However, this is the one that is most useful in the diagnostic context. And the next couple of slides, I hope I'll be able to uh, convince you of that. So I'll go through a few advantages of likelihood ratios, and then I'll explain how these are calculated, and then we'll discuss an example in practice. So likelihood ratios can be used in settings with different prevalences. So that will be a, a, a big positive. Likelihood ratios can also be used for variables with more than two outcomes. This means a diagnostic test result that has um, a maybe a negative result, potentially positive, and a definitely positive result. So if you have more than two outcomes, and potentially, uh, then the likelihood ratios can be used for each of those outcomes. Likelihood ratio uses all the cells of a two by two table. So they combine all the data that there is. And you might have discerned that with sensitivity, specificity, and predictive values, you're just looking at two of the four cells and you're making the calculations. But keep in mind that likelihood ratios use the data from all four cells. Likelihood ratio can also be used to calculate post-test probabilities. I'll come to this again in a second, but this is what you really need. You want to know what's the probability of the patient in front of you having acute appendicitis, given that they've had a positive ultrasound scan result. 
So based on that, you'll go further. If you think that the probability is 85%, you might go ahead with a diagnostic laparoscopy. If you uh, think that the probability is just 50%, you might just want to maybe wait and watch overnight or maybe do another scan, CT scan or something like that. Okay, right. So what are these? So we've learned why they're useful. Let's just try and figure out how do we um, uh, calculate them. So there are two likelihood ratios. One is the likelihood ratio of a positive test and the other is the likelihood ratio of a negative test. And just um, as the name suggests, it is the ratio of the likelihood of a positive test in those with the disease to the positive test in those without the disease. So you take people with the disease, and work out what's the likelihood of a positive test, IEA, and then you take people without the disease and work out what's the likelihood of a positive test, which is B, and you uh, find out, uh, calculate the ratio. In other words, if at all you wanted to make it more complicated, there's the formula. Some people refer to likelihood ratio of a positive test as true positives to false positives ratio. Uh, but again, uh, I would say that you can come back to these slides, have a little think about um, the calculations, and then hopefully it'll make sense with, the, with a bit of talk. But I'll, I'll crack on. Likelihood ratio of a negative test. It, it's very similar in concept. It's essentially the ratio of the likelihood of a negative test in those with disease to a negative test in those without disease. Again, the formulas are all here on the screen. Okay. And you're probably thinking, this is all getting very complicated. I'm not really sure how this is going to help me in my practice. Right. That's what we're going to talk about now. Why are they useful? Because they're used to calculate post-test probabilities. Okay. What do the clinicians need? The clinicians need to know what is the probability of the disease in question. That's what you and I need to know. And this is where you use the diagnostic test to help you um, with uh, understanding the probability of the disease in question. So let's just go back to basics for a second and try and think about what the meanings of probability and odds are. So we'll refer to probability as P and odds as O. And just about, uh, think uh, for, a, for a minute or two whether you really understand the difference between the two. And I'll just run this um, run through the definitions very quickly, but uh, you, you might want to come back to this. So probability refers to the likelihood of having the disease. So the probability of getting heads, if you toss a coin, is 0 0.5. Yeah, so hopefully that's straightforward. Odds refers to the likelihood of having the disease divided by the likelihood of not having the disease. Okay, so the odds of getting heads is not 0.5, it's 0.5 divided by 0.5, which is 1. Okay. And based on this, I hope you will agree with me that you can calculate the probability from a given odds and vice versa. Calculate odds based on a given probability. Okay. Now, likelihood ratio of a positive test enables you to calculate post test odds. And it's a very simple calculation. Post test odds equals pretest odds times likelihood ratio of a positive test. Okay, so if you're still with me, you can calculate post-test probability based on post-test odds. And then you have the probability of the disease in question. Right, now let's look at an example. I hope this will make things uh, a little bit clearer. So we'll go back to uh, the setting of right electrosa um, pain and tenderness, um, and let's consider two scenarios. Uh, two patients, different patients, referred by the GP. The first patient is a 25-year-old male with no prior history of abdominal pain. And the GP said, uh, please can you evaluate this patient, probable appendicitis. And then you have a 35-year-old female with a history of previous urinary tract infections, history of endometriosis, and coming in with abdominal pain. And again, the GP sent the patient to you, asking you to evaluate. Now, surely you'll agree that there is a difference in the likelihood of both of these patients having appendicitis. Therefore, let's put some numbers. So I have said that the probability of the, the male having appendicitis is 0.3, which means an odds of 0.5, because the odds is the prob probability of the patient having appendicitis 
to the probability of the patient not having appendicitis. So roughly 0.3 divided by 0.6, so that'll be 0.5, yeah? Now, if you look at the female, uh, you're probably thinking she, this, this might be just another UTI or endometriosis-related pain. It's unlikely to be appendicitis and so on. So um, let's say you attribute a probability of 1 in 20 to this patient. Now, you've got to keep in mind that you're doing this all the time. So you might not be specifying in your notes that it's 0.3 or 0.05, but you're probably going to be thinking uh, the male is a uh, higher likelihood of having appendicitis, and the female patient here is much uh, less likely to have appendicitis. Okay. Now, let's say that you apply a diagnostic test. Let's say you're asking uh, the patient some questions. You're looking for history of migratory pain. So a diagnostic test will come with parameters. And let's say the likelihood ratio of a positive test for this particular test is two. So if the patient has migratory pain, then in your own mind, you're thinking um, that the probability of appendicitis is going up. But it goes up differently in the two settings. And the way it does is that the, um, you multiply the pretest odds by the likelihood ratio to get a post-test odds. And in the 25-year-old male, that's uh, one, the post-test odds, which gives a post-test probability of 0.5, based on what we said about converting odds to probabilities. And in the 35-year-old female, you've got a post-test odds of 0.1, which gives you a post-test probability of 0 0.09. Okay, I hope you're still with me. We'll move on to the next step. So you're going to examine the patient and you find that the patient has percussion tenderness. So in your own mind, if they have percussion tenderness, you're thinking they're more likely to have appendicitis. And if you want to put a number to it, the diagnostic test parameter, which is likelihood ratio, the likelihood ratio of a positive test for percussion tenderness is 2.9. And then you calculate the post-test odds again. For the 25-year-old male, you worked out that the post-test odds and then the post-test probability have risen. The probability is now 0.74. And in the 35-year-old female, the probability is still only 0.22. That is, she's much more likely not to have appendicitis but something else like a UTI or endometriosis, right? So you can see that despite you using the same tests in both patients, you're coming, coming up with different probabilities. So you're going to take the 25-year-old male with migratory pain and percussion tenderness probably to theater for laparoscopy, or maybe you want to do an ultrasound scan. But you're probably going to be much more relaxed about this 35-year-old female who has the same migratory pain and the same percussion tenderness. So I hope this example gives you some understanding of why the same diagnostic test result might influence, might lead you to uh, doing different things. Because in your mind, with your experience and knowledge, and you are applying what we call Bayesian logic, and you are making some mental calculations of the importance of the diagnostic test result based on the background history, right? So you have used your understanding of pre-test prevalence in these two scenarios and then apply judiciously the results of the positive tests. And that's exactly what you do in a mathematical way when you talk about likelihood ratios of positive tests. Okay, so the sensitivity is not going to help you here. Specificity of your migratory pain or percussion tenderness is not going to help you here. Likelihood ratios will help you. And that's because they change the post-test odds and probabilities. And that based on the probability, you're going to move on to either another diagnostic test or you're going to plan an intervention. Okay, so I hope uh, that made some sense. So effectively, um, just to summarize what we've talked about, there are many different parameters to assess the usefulness of diagnostic tests. We've talked about um, briefly about all of them, sensitivity specificities, predictive values, and likelihood ratios. Keep in mind that sensitivity and specificity have a role in research and are of use to co uh, compare different tests, but little value in clinical practice. So you don't apply them directly to clinical practice. Predictive values have an important role in screening and likelihood ratios, especially likelihood ratio of the positive test, helps you estimate post-test probabilities 
and therefore are of value in clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.